yourself whether it's something that people should pay attention to. Um, from a financial perspective, trying to convince people with money that it's worth putting their money to play in that. And that really is more a conversation about the individuals involved than it is about the product because there's no, there's no history, there's no track record. You can provide research about that, but you can't give evidence that it's going to work. So in the beginning, it's very much a battle to survive and a battle to, to get people to believe in what you believe in. Um, and that's evolved over time. I think I think now it's much easier to, to get a door open. It's much easier to say, will you give me a sound ring? Will you listen to me? Will you take a look at our product? And, and that's a reflection of, of some of the success of the brand. And also, I think for us, we were we were very keen from the beginning that the product has to speak for itself. And that's quite a challenging road to take in our market because there were so many people who launched their brands around the same time as we did. And so much noise in the juice market that to differentiate yourself, you know, you see an article in the papers every week about green juice, about cold press. And to start with, we were getting quite frustrated. We're like, how do we, how do we get our message across? How do we get people to listen to us? And we took the view that our product will speak for itself in the end, and that is playing out now. The quality of the product, the different differentiation of the product. We've always taken a view that we do our own thing. We don't copy what other people are doing. We use ingredients that other people don't use. We do things that might seem counterintuitive, like making a black drink. But those are the things that have made us stand out. And I think what we're seeing now is a lot of that competition falling away or being left behind slightly, which is quite a nice place to be in. So I guess the challenge for us now is more around, we are still a small company from a practical perspective. We're a team of, of less than 10. Um, financially, it's always a struggle. When you're a business cash flow, it's always the biggest struggle. So always the next the worry is, where am I gonna find the money to do what we want to do next? But the, the bigger struggle, I guess, at this stage is we're starting to play with some of the big players now. And they have a huge amount of money, they have a huge amount of experience that we don't have. But we have to present ourselves in the way that they are. So, you know, when we're pitching to a big retail partner, we have to present ourselves as a, a very grown up and developed brand, which we aren't. But, you know, we're kind of lagging it a lot of the time. And it's difficult to do that on limited cash flow. So, for us now, it's making that transition through, through startup cute startup that everyone thinks is great and good for you for doing what you want to do to actually we're doing this seriously now and we need to do things properly and demonstrate that we're doing things properly. So I think that's probably our biggest challenge certainly over the next six months. And when you have conversations with investors how difficult is it to kind of explain what this whole wellness phenomenon is and do you think it's getting easier and how, is it, how do you feel those conversations have changed over time as the industry has matured? It's challenging. My uh, our investors are all None of them are from the wellness industry, so none of them were people who came to this from a perspective of wanting to be part of this huge wellness bubble. So we had to convince them that this was something that was worth investing in. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, they invested in the stock because I asked them to, and because they thought we were good people to invest in. Now, they can see that it's, it's something that is worth, is worth looking at, and it's playing out, and they see all, what they see in the papers is what we've been telling them. So the conversation has changed somewhat. Um, and the people who came in, first of all, we raised a little bit of money when we first started. In fact, that they put it in and the rate they did when we first started. Um, so the conversation now is, is more around, you know, what quantum of money do we need to be a big player rather than is this a sensible place to put the spare cash that I have? Um, and really, for companies like ours, if we want to grow to scale, we want to, it's all about having enough resource to get to that point. Um, sadly, the people who are now are the ones Yes, you have to have a good brand, you have to have a great product. If you don't have the money to be able to do the things that you need to do, you're not going to get to get that road. So the conversation now is how do we you know, how do we keep that firepower behind the business because you have yeah. to be to do it. And what do you think? Um, so you, when you look at your kind of customer lifestyle, obviously you have your, your early adopters, you have your innovators who, you know, two years ago were thinking about cleansing and detoxing and, and trying green juice as something that's cool to be seen drinking. Yeah. What do you think is now motivating, kind of, um, I guess, what, and similarly to, to most of you in the room, kind of as your audience expands from being just those early adopters and is now kind of more of the general public and more of the mainstream, what do you think is driving that? Well, we never saw ourselves as a traditional juice brand in terms of our customer demographic, because I think traditionally cold press juice when it came over from California was a, a preserve of people who do yoga, women mainly, to lose weight and we never want 
wanted our brand to be about that, partly because it's just not what Christoph and I say in terms of wellness. Um, so our customer demographic has never really been firmly rooted in that, and our branding has always been directed more at a, a kind of a unisex audience, if you like, um, probably more bordering on masculine. Um, that doesn't mean our customers are more male than female, they are generally more female than male, but we've tried to open up new doors for, for ourselves. And that's partly a gender thing, but also partly the person who who doesn't think that they're healthy can still drink our drinks. Even if they don't want to be healthy, they can drink them because they taste really good. And it's a it's a great experience drinking them. So we don't want we want, don't want to just be going after that traditional market. And there is a, a whole market outside of London available to us of people who are interested in good tasting products that are well sourced, that are high quality, who don't have to be interested in losing weight. And that's the market we're going after. And in doing that, we're looking at the ways that that people in this country socialise differently to the way that they do in California or New York, and there are differences. So rather than I was talking to Andrew about this just before we, we started talking, when you come to a market and you come against competitors who are kind of firmly rooted in that market, you don't necessarily have to go through them, you can go around them. And that's sort of the approach that we're taking about. And that will become more apparent over the next six months as well, the way our brand becomes. So um, tell us a little bit about that, about how your brand will develop over the next six months and perhaps some of the newer doors that you're opening that maybe are slightly less conventional for a yeah. more brand. I mean, I think one of the advantages that we've always had is that our drinks do taste really good. Well. So that's exactly the one. <laughs> no, I can, they, they taste really good. And they, um, they taste interesting, and again, they're not rooted in, they're not of that ilk where it's green, so it's good for me, so I'm going to drink it. That's never where we were coming from. And one of the benefits of that is that you can, there are different occasions when you would drink them. So you won't just drink them when you're doing a cleanse. You'll drink them socially, you'll drink them in a bar, in a restaurant. Um, whereas drinking a green juice in a restaurant, I think, you generally you go to a restaurant in which you want to have fun and you want to do something that's social and not being unrestricted. So you don't really want to drink something that tastes like fart, you want to drink something that tastes good. So that environment works quite well for us and, and we, as kind of owners of this brand, as social people, that's where we socialise. So I, you know, we've always seen that as a market that we could potentially work in. Um, so probably about a year ago now, we started that conversation um, with the kind of premium restaurants and bars. And you'll probably see now that you can buy a lot of our drinks in those locations now, like the Gordon Ramsay restaurants, like Dorchester, like Foxlow. Um, and it tends to be the drinks, I mean, I don't know if everyone knows our products, but the drinks like our black drink, like our cola, that if you saw them on a shelf in a health food store, they're not necessarily the first thing that someone would reach for, not that they're not healthy, but they're not, they don't have a And the other thing about our drinks is that they have a major kick to them usually. So if you're not drinking alcohol, which increasingly I think people of our age and younger are, you want a viable alternative. But you want an alternative that's not childish, it's not jokey, it's premium. In our alcohol, we expect premium drinks. In our cocktails, we expect premium. Why do we not expect that in our soft drinks? So that's sort of where we're looking at other areas in which our customers, our potential customers, and customers might be drinking. That's kind of what we're seeing all across. Um, we don't want to kind of um, keep you too long and it was about having kind of a short conversation this morning so um, I do want to open it up to any of you that might have a question for Rebecca or for us um, and I guess my last question for Rebecca is kind of what do you see, where do you see the industry going in the UK and how do you um, see kind of um, global drivers shaping the UK wellness industry? Uh, well, as you know, I'm a big cynic about the wellness industry in general. Not that I don't buy into wellness, I totally do. I came at, at this from a, a perspective of working in banking for a long time, and I became a yoga teacher, so I, I have a, a wellness practice, if you like. Um, but I'm quite a cynic about the wellness industry. I don't, I don't buy into the sort of social media image of what wellness is. Um, I don't buy into the twenty-something person who is genetically disposed to looking the way that they look and selling that to to an individual as something to aspire to. I, that's not inspirational to me. So I don't I don't buy into any of that and I don't but I do think that's a huge driver in our industry at the moment. It's something that we have to accept as a brand that social media and those images do play a big, big part in why people choose our products. But I do think that will evolve. I think that's because we're at the beginning of, of a kind of growth 
work in this industry and I think that will evolve into a more embedded understanding that longevity, life longevity, is rooted in the way that you behave, the way that you treat your body, the way that you consume food, um, which is not about weight loss and it's not about looking good in a picture, it's about, it's about something more than that. So I think, I think it's about an evolution of the industry. We're very much at the beginning of that and we would like to be a brand that is not really too tied up in that kind of aesthetic part of that. You probably, you'll see very few selfies on our Instagram or like that because we just don't, we don't buy into that stuff. And we also don't really rubbish pictures. But, um, <laughs> so I think, I think where we're moving to is a much more embedded and ingrained understanding of that. And I don't think that's a government thing. A lot of people ask whether there should be more legislation, like the sugar tax. The sugar tax for us is actually very good from a product perspective, but I don't kind of believe in that really. I don't think it comes from a government level. I think it comes from a just deeper understanding and connection to what we eat and how we eat, um, which in social media helps that thing. But I'll still be assuming that it Does anyone have any questions for Rebecca? Probably more of a question than Christopher. So Christopher's my business partner, um, and, and we met um, and kind of built this brand together. Christopher has a lifelong kind of passion for plants, so it's really out of his understanding and passion for, for, for different ingredients, how they affect the body, um, rather than the traditional angle, which is about kind of replenishing your body. I'm sorry, I didn't actually mean to say that. <laughs> That actually slipped out. That nourishing your body and trying to lose weight. So um, yeah, it's about what plants can do for you and, and how you kind of the kind of different things they can do for your body. The love of it is that we would continuously experiment with different things. Yeah. And that's sort of reflected actually. In some of our drinks are quite divisive. So one of our best-selling drinks is this little um, shot, which is is very hot. It's very complex with 14 ingredients in it, and it's one of our best sellers drink it they either love it or they hate it and our drinks are quite divisive and we're not trying to make them appeal to everybody we're just trying to demonstrate to them introduce an ingredient to them that they wouldn't normally consume in a way that we think is is interesting and if they like it great
The answer is it's an evolving, it's an evolving concept for us. I think probably when we first started, we weren't that good at it actually, because you know we were our products were placed alongside products that looked the same, and there wasn't we weren't communicating that difference very effectively. We've got much better as, as time goes on. I hope we will evolve as, as we go further down the line. Um, it's challenging because really the the differentiator in our products are those ingredients, and the understanding of that is is why people buy them, not, not, not just that because of the taste as well. So we try to educate, and what we do, a lot of what we're talking about isn't kind of common things that are being discussed in this area at the moment, but what we're finding is there's a bit of a time lag on these things. So yeah, we, we started a conversation about adaptogens about a year ago that we use a lot in our drinks, and that's becoming a much more common one that people use now. Um, so we're sort of trying to lead the way and as yeah, you know, as more people do those things, that's great because the, the conversation gets bigger and people understand more. Um, but it's challenging, yeah. And you guys have to have to deal with the restrictions in the UK on labelling as well, right? Yeah, it's a constant challenge for us here, and, and I, I would say this because it's something we're dealing with at the moment. But I think that the legislation rules here are very, very restrictive about what you can and can't say. Um, we don't make health claims on our drinks, but we do want to give people as much information as we can about what's in there and why we put it in there. Um, but you're incredibly restricted about what you can say in that regard. Um, and the things that are deemed to be healthy and to be are very narrow. And that for us doesn't work as a brand because we don't want to be narrow. We want to be broad. We want to be introducing ingredients that, that aren't commonly available. So it, it, it is a bit of a challenge for us. Um, and I guess that transfers over to having conversations with buyers from much bigger entities now. They've never seen things like this before and getting them comfortable with it and getting them, com them comfortable with why, why they have to pay more, why they have to treat it differently is a challenge as well. But it's all part of the evolution of it and I think as a business owner, one of the downsides of operating in this industry is that we are at the, at the front of the market so one of your challenges is educating as you go along, whereas if you're in an industry that's somewhat developed, you can ride on the coattails of what people have done before. So it's just kind of one of the challenges. Yeah. 
so you can track it much better on online because you can see where, where your customer is coming from. Our online business is, I would say, 80% London based. Um, and I think, as with most, most things, unfortunately, they start in London and they kind of spread outwards. One of the biggest challenges now as we're looking to move outside of London is price. You know, our product costs six pounds a bottle and I recognise that that's an expensive price for a drink um, and something that that either the market needs to create a greater, greater understanding in the consumer for them to pay that price or the price needs to come down. And what we're seeing now in our market is what I would call a race to the bottom. So a lot of our competitors are just seeing how cheaply they can produce their product in order to make it appeal to a wider audience. That is not something we'll get involved in because in that race, the biggest person will always win. You know, the person with the most money is always going to be able to buy their ingredients cheaper and make it cheaper. And also, do we want to continually downgrade our product? Do we want to continually make it cheaper? Use worse quality ingredients, simplify our product. Our product's about complexity. It's about you know interesting ingredients blended in a way that you can't do at home on your own. So that's not a race that we will get involved in. Having said that, there is a market outside of London and there is a market outside of London that operates in a different way than it does in London. The health and wellness market outside of London isn't the same. Um, and what you'll see from us in the next six months is how we'll expand our brand into those places, but in a slightly different way. So you mentioned you're in banking and yoga. What made you choose such a complex wellness drink? You know, it's starting to shelf life and you have two dreams in that and all the different avenues we've gone down. Yeah. What made you choose? I'd love to tell you there was a grandfather that was an <laughs> accident. No, I mean um I fell into this uh, much more than Christoph did. I mean Christoph, as I said, has got a, a kind of long term love of plants and what they do. My my involvement in the wellness industry is more as a consumer um, and as a kind of as a yoga teacher so I know the market from that perspective. Um, if I'd have known Complexity of it at the start, we would have done it, the other um, And we're very much learning as we go along. Um, and I think, I think that's probably the same as most people. You can write a business plan 14 times over, but it never works out that way, I don't think. Um, and uh, if we went back again, would we do it differently? I think absolutely we would. Um, we do a lot of the things that we've done sooner, um, probably wasted a lot less money, um, gone down a few less dead ends, but I think it's as I say, but. <laughs> Tracy does, I do. <laughs> yeah, it's some um, who tastes our drinks when we're making them, we're experimenting with them. It's a kind of, yeah, it's a, there's no science to it really. It's, um, we go out, we try it with lots of different people, we see what, see what the results are. What sort of stuff I think love with is for drinks? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the ingredients we use are quite strong um, and potent in our drinks um, and in the experimentation stage they're even more potent so you know we quite often walk out of, walk out of the pantry so we're in the <laughs> but yeah it's mainly us the experimentation point and also they, they've evolved as time has gone on so our customers are our not our experimentation that sounds awful but from a taste perspective we can see what works and what doesn't work we have quite a broad range of 12 drinks now um, and some of those have changed and some of them have gone completely that haven't worked um, some of the ones that don't work so well we tweak over time so it's, it's a process of evolution with the customer and I think actually the market's moved quite a lot in terms of what customers want um, I think on day one if we brought out the, the black drink I don't think we would have had anyone drinking it but as it happened it was the first of its kind and it, and it was in a lot of press and that's one of our most popular drinks so yeah. How do you deal with um, like wastage because obviously inevitably these types of drinks and juices have a very short shelf life in general. So in terms of like your stockists, say you were trying out a new stockist and you had, I don't know, you delivered 50 units and they, they didn't sell them all. Do you do like a buy and return and then what do you guys do with them? Do they just... No, because we're really hard with them. <laughs> um, we, get, we don't have a huge amount of wastage now that we have a longer shelf life. Yeah. I think the wastage on a short shelf life was, was much larger. Um, we run our stock quite tightly. Um, so we produce every week, um, we monitor our stock levels, so actually wastage internally that we have is very, very low.